Hello, and thank you for tuning in to the Good Governance course from Warrington Voluntary Action. My name is Brian. I'm going to guide you through this session today. Now, if you look at the time bar at the bottom, you will see that we've split this up into sections. So if you need, do need to revisit it, you can just jump to the bit that you need. This course is a condensed version of a much longer version that WVA deliver. Uh, if you want more information on that, get in touch with the WVA team and we can take it through and make it bespoke for you and the work that you do. This course is going to look at the bigger picture, so how legislation and how the general rulings around governing a group operate and some of the considerations that you might want to put into your planning and put into your discussions when you think about planning what you do. We're going to look at the groundwork, which is the basics around policies, procedures, paperwork, all that stuff that people find quite boring and quite mystifying. We'll hopefully try and simplify it and make it accessible and easy to use so you can get on with doing the stuff you love. We're going to look at the reality, which is some of the things that people often neglect to do about measuring impact or staying on track. Some of those things make a huge difference when we come to look at funding or when we meet a challenge in our organisation and we need to just tighten up or rethink what we've done. And ultimately, this whole course is about keeping it simple and trying to make things as easy as possible because we're busy enough and none of us have enough time and especially not to spend a lot of time on governance. So if we can make our governance the most effective it can be, we get to do all the fun stuff instead. And who doesn't want to do that? So let's get started into some of the legislation, some of the policies and paperwork. And like making a cake, governance is a bit like a perfect recipe. Everybody needs the same ingredients, what the levels that you use them at will be different for different groups. So have a think about what you want to achieve and put in different levels of different things in order to get the outcome you want. Even if you are not a registered charity, you will still work within some charity law or some guidelines. You'll be looking at the guidelines around public benefit that we'll talk about later but also just the idea of what charitable means and the idea of how we support people to get the best out of their lives. So you might not be a charity, but a lot of these things do still kind of apply to what it is that you do. We all have rules on trading and other legal compliance in terms of recommendations on insurance and recommendations on how your finances work. The WVA team are always here to talk about these kind of logistics if you need us. Because you might not be registered or in a lot of ways our sector kind of goes ungoverned, we look at the concept of best practice, we look at the concept of what collective experiences we've had and trying to learn from those. And that's why plugging into networks and forming partnerships and even just using other people as a sounding board is super important because you're going to gather other people's experiences. You're going to gather other people's ideas on best practice. And then you can compare them to your own and decide what's best for you. We've also then got on top of that moral considerations. We've moved very dramatically, very quickly as a society recently. And we now look at groups of people, situations, words, activities in very different ways. And it's worth thinking about who we might be hurting or triggering or who we might be missing out by doing what we do. So we have a moral consideration to add on to this level already and we can create our own system of what's right and what's wrong. There are a series of things that I would like you to think about when you are having your committee meetings, when you're writing your policies, when you are forming funding bids or ideas. And these are big overarching concepts that I just want you to kind of check in and ensure that you're doing. I mean, to think about the fact that are we charitable? 
Are we benefiting people and are we benefiting people for good? And are those people needing what it is that we're trying to deliver? Is there a difference between our need to have and our nice to have? And ultimately we're heading towards trying to provide that need to have. Are you self-regulating? Meaning, is your board, your committee, your trustees, your directors, whatever you want to call them, are they managing each other and are they managing themselves? Are they ensuring that everything is happening to the best of your resources, to the best of your ability, and that if anything isn't going well, is someone challenging it? And are you trying to solve that challenge? And are you trying to support people to get to the best that they can be? And those people, I mean the committee and the board. Sometimes we think oh, we can't sack them because they're on the committee and they're a volunteer. You don't have to go to the degree of sacking people, but what you can do is regulate and challenge behaviour or lack of behaviour. There's different ways in which you can regulate, and we're going to talk about that as we go through this session. As part of self-regulating, it's also about holding yourself and each other accountable. Are you doing what you promised you would do? Promised you would do? Promised you say you would do even? So. You've made a commitment to be part of this board, this organisation, and are you actually fulfilling that? And uh, is everybody else checking up on that and making sure it's happened? That accountability goes to many, many levels. You might also be part of a bigger registered concept. So you might have a governing body. If you're a sports club, you might be registered with a charity commission or company's house. Are you doing what you need to do to fulfil that registration or that affiliation? An organisation is nothing without its mission. It needs to have a purpose. It needs to have a point. Do you know what that mission is? Does that mission still fit in today's society? Does it still fit people's needs right now? And therefore, are you focused on that mission? Do you use that mission in your meetings to remind everybody of why they're there? Do you use that mission to spark off ideas for projects and funding bits? That mission is the be all and end all of who you are and what you are, but it can change and it can evolve. It's not necessarily fixed. So it's always a time to revisit your mission. You can use the WV Reflect tool in order to do that. So many different tools, many different ways. And indeed, a good old chat with the WVA team can help you stay mission focused. You're often using public money. You're using donor money. You could be using member money. You can also be making decisions which actually have quite a big effect on the community and the people around you. And therefore, is everything you're doing transparent? Are you creating some sort of unnecessary liability for yourself by keeping things a secret? You might not think that it's anybody's business, but because you're doing things for the public, suddenly it's public business. So therefore, are you transparent with your decisions and your actions? And we're going to talk about how to record those later. And lastly, are you consistent? Do you have create rules and follow them and have the same rules for everybody? You'll have a system, you should have a process, you should have policies. Does everybody get the same experience? Does everybody get the same journey? Do they know what they're going to come to when they come to your service? Do you make decisions in the same way? Does everybody within your leadership team follow the same rules? This is important for so many ways. Firstly, it means that your service is strong and remains something that people can recognise and want to be part of. It means that funders know that if they are going to invest money in you, that the outcome is going to happen. It also means that your consistency will keep check on situations like safeguarding concerns or any concern that somebody might have about your work with a, a diverse community or in a chat dealing with a challenging situation that consistency is important in running through with a system and a process but we're going to talk about that as we expand further into the course 
We're going to start with a section about the concept of public benefit. Now, this is going to include language from the Charity Commission. You don't have to be a charity or a registered body to buy into this system. Uh, the language that's going to appear on the screen is taken straight from the Charity Commission. I will warn you in advance though, it does say the same thing in lots of different words. So I'm going to give you the general gist, but also if you check out the description box below, the information on public benefit will all be there so you can read it and digest it at your own leisure. So it seems really obvious to say, but the public benefit concept is about benefiting the public. It feels glaringly obvious, but it's kind of worth saying it out loud. So the benefit part is about doing more good than harm. So essentially, whatever it is that you're doing is helping people reach their potential, fulfilling any needs they might have, reducing any distress or challenges they might be living with in their lives. It does acknowledge that sometimes there is harm that you have to do. And what they mean by harm is that Sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. Sometimes you have to create systems where people can only access for a limited amount of time. And during that time, they're empowered to go off and try and solve their challenges themselves outside your work. Sometimes that harm is that, no, this isn't the organization for you. And we will signpost you to somebody who's more suited. And it could well be that that feels like a, a big setback to them or a challenge that nobody wants to work with them. But it's, it's how you do that that is the mark of a strong organisation rather than you trying to be all things to all people because that's pretty much impossible. The public element of it is about as many people as you can. Now, this doesn't mean everybody and i'm going to say that twice because it doesn't mean everybody because we can't work with everybody no matter how many groups will say oh yeah you know we will help anybody actually you're set up to work with a specific group of people acknowledging who that group of people is and promoting who that group of people is has so many wider benefits in that you can target and focus your funding. You can target and focus your work. You can see how you slot into the bigger picture, which is Warrington's quite diverse community and voluntary sector. So understanding who your version of public is, is a really important thing because how do you know you're helping them if them is a massive group of people? So what you're doing is you're trying to benefit the public in general. You're not being so, so niche that you're isolating a whole vast section of the public. So I usually use the example, and I'll use it here as well, that an organisation for ginger guys called Graham doesn't always work because actually there's not enough of them to qualify to have an organisation. They might want to be a social group or a little gang or a squad or whatever, and that's fine. But to set it up as an organisation, there simply aren't enough people to meet that need. If you wanted to do people with red hair or people with, I don't know, any difference, any need or challenge, then think about how broad that is, how many people that covers. Do they exist locally? Do they exist in your community? And if they do, do they need an organisation to create a service for them? Is their challenge something that they want to access a service about? Ultimately, it's about the biggest group of people you possibly can. And that group of people has to be local, has to be somebody that needs it. And what you're doing has to have more than what they call incidental personal benefit. And we're going to break that down. So as a committee member, as a board member, trustee, whatever you want to call it, however you deem your board, in your organization, you have a responsibility and you have a responsibility to make sure that public benefit happens. You have a duty of care. And this means a few things. This is about understanding how what you do 
is beneficial, what the outcomes are, what the impact is, and we're going to come to impact measurement later. But don't forget, WV can help you with that. It's knowing who the people are that you benefit. I would argue they should be the other way around, but that's how the Charity Commission write it. Knowing who your audience is, knowing who your market is, and knowing the challenges that they have mean that you can set up systems and services that serve them the best they can be served and help them reach their potential and where they want to be. It's understanding that within that service there will be risk. There could be harm that people come to and how you manage that and reduce the likelihood of risk as much as you possibly can. It would also take into account how people can get involved in your service. Is it service people have to pay for? If they are getting it for free, where is the perceived value in it? How do they access that in a way which keeps you sustainable, but also keeps them engaged? It's thinking about where you deliver that service. Are you delivering it someplace that people can't get to? Or is it someplace that's on a really accessible travel route for public transport? Or is there a car park? Is it someplace that people with living aids um, who have physical disabilities who, in whatever form, can they get in? Once they're in, can they navigate their way around the space? Do you need a hearing loop? Is the building big and echoey and really wide and quite intimidating? Or is it very small and claustrophobic? Who, what suits, sorry, the people that you're working with better? Equally, do you have any personal benefit that people kind of get out of it? which is kind of a, a product of what it is that you're doing. Um, so what they say is no more than a necessary result. So this is ultimately, are people getting out of it what you are intending for them to get out of it? Anything else is a happy addition. It's not a promise that you're making. Equally, somebody isn't walking away potentially financially better off. People aren't walking away getting a whole bunch of services for free that either should be paid for in another capacity or is duplicating a paid service elsewhere. Um, there's a lot of nuances to that. Some groups really struggle with that issue and absolutely that's something that we WVA can support you with. It's also about protecting your liability as a committee member or a trustee or director. You have way more protection when you're a registered organisation. If you are a constituted group or a community group, the liability very much falls on the committee and their own lives and resources. And most often it's the chair that takes the final rap for whatever it is that may or may not go wrong. So it's the thought of, are you doing the best you can with the information and the resources and the skills that you have? And are you recording that? Most liability cases that come uh, to the point of prosecution or the point of somebody having to um, pay back monies, etc., come from poor recording, from a lack of clear, clear decision, and from a, a real just lack of process and regard. So ultimately, do you have everything in place to protect yourselves from anything that might happen to go awry? So, to kind of summarise all of this, it's making sure that it fits your purpose, fits your mission, it's for the benefit of the public as a whole, it's about fitting all of the guidance and good practice, and it fits in with you making a clear decision which is the best you can with the knowledge, resources, and skills that you have. When you break it down, it sounds really simple, but actually doing it in real life isn't particularly. So the rest of this is all about how do we actually make that happen? I'm going to take you now through a consideration about how the board is made up. 
and how how a committee can be structured and there's kind of two different ways there's a a traditional model which there's technically nothing wrong with and there's a slightly more contemporary model which is based on best practice so this um gavel is to symbolize the chair now in most situations the chair is kind of the center of the universe and they work with a a posse or a holy trinity of the chair the secretary and the treasurer and these three posts tend to be your executive committee and they tend to be the people where the buck stops and all roads lead to what roads could lead to them are your governing body talking back and forward to either the charity commission or your ngb or um whoever might be commissioning you so again works with things like funders service users there's a lot of information and language going back and forward to different groups of people so your funders and your service users will theoretically be speaking back and forward to that exec the rest of the committee then feed off of that and what happens is there's a 360 view but it belongs to a very small group of people so your 360 view often exists within your chair or it will exist within your chair your secretary and your treasurer and usually everybody else is a little bit kind of in the dark or a little bit baffled because not everybody's allowed in and especially Especially there are times when the chair, secretary and treasurer will make decisions and not bother telling everybody else. Now, if we go back to the concept of public benefit and we think about liability, that's when suddenly you start to put yourself on a bit shaky ground. Because if you start making decisions that not everybody knows about or you start just going off rogue and acting on things, you don't have the protection of the rest of the organisation. So some a lot of this is also about protecting you as well as getting work moving quickly. So yep, there is a 360, but traditionally it belonged to the chair and that can be a really challenging and lonely place. And remember, WV is always here for you chairs if you want to speak to us, but it can be a place where you feel like you're doing everything and nobody's helping you. Have a think about how you can create stronger systems and more effective systems to get everybody involved. Because if we think about a slightly more contemporary model, what we have is all of the board no longer in a hierarchical pyramid, but what we have is the board all on a line. And we give the board different responsibilities. You could have a rolling chair. You don't necessarily, unless for whatever structural reason you need to have a chair, but you don't need to have a fixed one. As long as somebody chairs the meeting, it doesn't have to be the same person every time. So you could have somebody that's in charge of your service delivery. You could have somebody that's in charge of marketing and PR, somebody that does your funding, somebody that keeps all the minutes and does the paperwork. You can kind of split the roles along your committee what that does is it means that there is many more two-way conversations so your service users as symbolized by this heart have ways in which they can get information but ways in which they can give information and it's sometimes even more effective if you can have a specific person that's designed to liaise with your service users and your people because then everybody knows where all roads lead to if a service user needs to talk to the board. You can have somebody who talks directly up to your NGB or charity commission, etc. Whoever's created that funding bid or that project becomes the lead for that specific piece of work. It means that now we're not just dumping everything on one person. It means that you can have somebody going off making partnerships or representing the organisation at meetings or other wider strategic boards across the town. It also means that you can have access to volunteers, staff, etc. And the information comes straight to you as a board, as opposed to you sort of guessing what goes on down on the ground. 
the benefit of all of this is that the 360 no longer lives with one person or at the very most three people and that the 360 exists within the whole organization everybody has somebody they can contact everybody has somebody that they can connect to and get support from it also dissolves the liability a bit more it also means that everybody is part of that decision making but it also means that you have to self-regulate more and the accountability becomes way more important so you will have to ensure that whatever role anybody's volunteered to take on they fulfill it we're going to look at more logistics in a bit let us move on now to a section about paperwork and how you can document the journey but also how you can make things as easy for yourself by having the right papers in front of you this is a big part of our reflect tool as well so if you need support on that hit up the wva reflect and we will support you through that journey chris cornforth who is a third sector kind of commentator theorist um, and writer makes this statement about kind of governance and i wonder if any anagram geeks out there can work out what these two words are so they are the something and something concerned with ensuring the overall direction supervision and accountability of an organization and i'm going to put you out your misery because it's system and process ultimately everything we're about to talk about from now on is about that the systems and the processes that can involve your paperwork your protocols the things that you just do on a on a daily basis on an hourly basis and how they fit into something bigger that makes the really effective machine that is your organization so let's have a look at governing document first of all every organization should have a governing document what that governing document will be called and how big it is and what's in it will vary on your legal structure the size of your organization the way your board is made up multiple different factors if you want support on this absolutely we can help you with this this is this is group development 101 working with uh, governing documents for us so we're good at this stuff now a governing document is ultimately how you make decisions who you are what you do all of that kind of affair it talks about your powers it talks about the aims of what you do it talks about what obligations you've set up for the purposes of this i'm going to talk about it as a constitution but it can also be called a memorandum and articles and um no, it could probably be called a constitution or a memorandum and articles. Let's not make it more complicated than it needs to be. So I'm going to call it constitution just for the sake of this illustration. It's going to cover that your group is conducted in a responsible way. And that ultimately means how our board meet, how they make decisions, how they take votes, how your AGM happens, what would happen if the organization needs to change or close it's kind of everything surrounding the the conducted work it talks about how you're going to be accountable and how you are going to document that ultimately it's trying to make sure that there is no one person who wields complete power and it will therefore mention potentially the roles of different committee members it will also mention how as i said before how decisions are met and made and pulls together essentially to the outside world and i suppose internally because hopefully it's a working document how we do what we do and proves to everybody that what you do is good and that you do it well so a lot of funders will look to see your governing document if anybody who's supporting you to try and solve a challenge or an issue um, will look to see your governing document if in doubt start there and 
seek out some further paperwork if it isn't contained within this document. We're often asked what you should put in it. And the answer to that question is, who are you and what do you do? We've created a bit of a list here. Um, the information from this will be in our resource section, which is linked in the description box below. So you have a kind of paper guidance on this. So just to kind of summarize some things that you would need to have in your governing document, you would need to have your mission, you have what you're set out to do and why you exist. And this is the thing that you will always go back to when you start a new project or when you're just doing a bit of a health check or a reflection on your organization and how well you're doing. It will talk about who your board might be, who the, where the liability sits, um, how they are protected and to a certain degree what, they, what the expectations are, what what makes a, a good board member and how how they're expected to behave. You will either have trustees or committee members, officers, multiple different words depending on the your legal structure, but how many people should be there? How long can they serve? What is a quorum in your uh, decision-making system? How they are elected, what they do if they want to leave, all the kind of HR, I suppose, of your committee members or trustees. You might want to talk about your fundraising powers. You're probably likely to have a separate finance policy, but there'll be a kind of summary of it within your constitution. If you're a very small group, you might just have all of your finance information in your constitution, but some nod to how you manage money will go into this. We'll talk about who can call a meeting, how they can call a meeting, how it's minuted, how it's recorded, and that will also go for uh, decisions and actions too. So how, how are decisions made uh, equally under what interest is it always attached to the mission or could it be the mission of uh, another subgroup or a subcommittee, etc. Um, in this in this modern age that sounded really um official but it's the thought of how how do we communicate traditionally that wouldn't have been part of a constitution but because communication and outward promotion is such a huge part of how an, an organization can survive now it's often worth considering how do you have a, a robust communication system so Again, depending on the size of your group, you might have a separate policy, but somewhere you have a nod about who does your external communications, be them in real life or virtually, who is the person that does that, how are they monitored, how are they um, screened and um, evaluated. As I've already said, some of these things run in parallel with other policies. Got a big list of policies here. WV can provide you with templates on any of this and support on creating one bespoke to your organisation. I'm going to have a brief rant about templates, if you'll forgive me. Don't just blindly take the template, change the name and assume that it works. Make sure you read it and understand it and know that you're not thwarting anything you want to do by something that's written in that policy. So go through it, make sure it fits, make sure it's legible and logical to what it is that you want to do. Policy ran over, you'll be glad to know. Policies can be about anything. Uh, they're literally making sure that you have a system and a process that fits what it is that you do and how it is that you do that. And this can be anything from the safeguarding world around adults and children, how you deal with information, how your finances work, how you solve problems, how you keep people safe, how your volunteering system works. You could policy practically anything. But ultimately, they really have to be bespoke, fit your organisation and fit what you do. We can provide as much support as you need from WVA on this topic. 
and we do it all the time and we're pretty good at it so use us we're good i'm going to kind of briefly hover into a, a question and a reflection and something that people have asked um through my time at wva is should it be hard work why is it so hard work i'm very very tired and um, the answer is yes and no ideally if you've got a whole bunch of people around you and you've got the right systems in place then no it shouldn't be potentially some of the reasons that you're tired and it isn't working and isn't going well is that you're maybe trying to be one person against the world or the system might have worked on your first setup but things have changed since then and sometimes we try and fit what we can see in front of us but not fit actually what's going on in the background and change some of your governance so the tools and the systems that we're going to talk about in the rest of this session are kind of answering this question of it might be hard work to start with but once you're set up and established then hopefully not but it does take a bit of work to start and the wv reflect tool as i've mentioned before is a brilliant place to go through and work out where you're at with your governance and where you might just need to make some tweaks or make some additions or make some cuts and make it yours that you can own and that you can be proud of and do the work you need to do with as hopefully little hassle as possible two different ways of doing this is about the recording that you do and the ways in which you document decisions and actions uh, a, a good practice or a kind of contemporary good practice certainly is the concept of decision logs and action logs now these are tables that are kind of ongoing working documents the benefit of both of these is that you will be able to journey through where the root of an issue might have come from or the start of a project you might be able to use them for impact measurement you can use them for multiple different things but ultimately it is a really basic sort of matrix table and there are templates for that in our resource section on the wva site so you're really just looking at when what who why so the date the decision by whom and what the logic was behind it and that's really so you can go back and see who said what it also takes into account that in our uh, more modern digital uh, way of working it means that a few people can get together and make a decision either virtually or in person put it on this log share it with everybody and then everybody can have an input on it so there might be decision which is a sort of penciled in decision or a preliminary decision which is then verified by everybody else but it might be altered by the time other voices are involved so it's an ongoing working thing now when you do record that keep the preliminary version and then add on the official one too because it really shows the journey protects your liability also just works for you to be able to reflect on your last year and be able to see kind of what's the bits we do well or actually where did it go wrong it went wrong between that decision and that decision so it's it's useful as a as a diary almost so as an example here is a random date in 2021 we decided that we were going to make changes to our system members of our team Alison James and Helen decided this but the logic behind it was it would have greater accuracy and an actual true reflection of our service if we made some tweaks to the reporting element of it and it's really just to say it was from this point onwards in a fictitious decision that was made in a fictitious September 2021 but ultimately we could trace back and see where that came from we can also somewhere in a fictitious October restructure a funding course which was decided by Caitlin and myself and we did that because 
We know that people can no longer access full days for multiple different reasons, so we were going to do it in chunks instead because it fitted the way people work better. All of those things are so we can look back and go, when did that happen or why did that happen? A lot of the time we're working so quickly and we're working so much kind of against <laughs> against challenges and we're firefighting that we don't always appreciate partly where we've come from, but also sometimes we can't always rationalise where that came from. So this is a part of that um, recording. We can also take this process and put it into our consideration around actions. A couple of benefits of doing action logs this way is because it's very open and accountable. When we talked before about transparency, this is the ultimate in everybody in the board can see who was meant to do what and by when and can also see whether they've did it when we talk about self-regulating this is a big part of it so again it's a very similar concept in terms of who what why where um, again there's a rationale but on the end of it just for you to be able to add some extra notes or explain kind of what would happen so in this marvelous fictitious October that we all had somebody's action was to complete the reflect tool. Did I mention the reflect tool? We've got a reflect tool. The person we've decided to be responsible is our friend Anne from a group. We're going to give it the target of January 21 to establish that, which is bizarre since our action started in 21. That's what you get when you don't proofread. And the remark on here is that she's going to feedback all of our findings to the committee and we're going to kind of take it from there and see where it goes. Good lesson in accuracy there. Make sure that your things are accurate and your numbers add up. But you get the general gist, hopefully. Other things you can add on are wider, longer term concepts. These things don't have to be something you have to do next week. These could just be missions that we revisit every so often. So things like recruiting new board members or an ongoing publicity campaign or an on going fundraising drive or whatever that happens to be and you can all be responsible for some of these things you can have whole groups of people or you could have individuals you can also involve other agencies so it could be that you add in the sort of partner expectations that you have if you're working with another group um, so these are flexible documents they're very very fluid they can be adapted all the time but don't ultimately don't try and delete things add things in cross-reference because ultimately the more information you can put out there the more you are protected for your liability because everything is laid bare for you to see so that's decision logs and action logs there are templates for those in the resource library and if you've got any questions give us a holler and we'll help you I've mentioned this a couple of times before, but impact measurement is increasingly important to modern organisations for multiple different reasons. Many people are scrutinising organisations more, funders, people potentially wanting to partner, people commissioning, and also members and audiences and service users are being more um, aware of their expectations of organisations and what they think an organisation should deliver and having a strong and clear idea on what the differences that you make can be the difference between people accessing your service and not can be the difference with you getting funding or not and the difference between you existing and not ultimately. So what is impact measurement? Why do we need to do it? Anything that you do from that measurement should, what they say, speak to the organisation itself. It should directly influence what you do now and into the future. So it lets you know what's going well. It lets you know what you need to do some more work on. It allows you to be kind of the best you can be and react to the community in the most effective way. There are four stages to impact measurement there's no official place to start they kind of work in a circle 
but I'm going to break them down with a bit of a narrative to hopefully try and make it as kind of clear um, as I can. So, it works in a circle. And it starts with your input, leads to your output, which then leads to your outcomes, which ultimately talk about what your impact is. So let's break those terms down. So your inputs are the things that you have. It's usually stuff. So it will be resources, um, the building that you're in, the people that you have that are receiving the service as well as the people providing it. It's all the kind of physical tools that work together. The outputs are the more abstract things, the idea behind it, the concept of the activity, the things that you do, the processes about it. So the processes about screening or the information that you're giving, etc. So that's kind of the abstract element. So inputs and outputs are the hard physical stuff and then the abstract stuff that you do alongside it. The outcomes are the learning. What have we achieved from this? So do we need to change what we've done? Do we need to rethink that, do it at a different time, do it with more people, less people, different kind of people? Um, or actually, did it work really, really well? And we, we don't need to change a thing. The impact is then looking at all of those things together and working out what the difference is that it's made. So that's things like what we call social value. Going back to the concept of public benefit, have, have people's lives been kind of changed or benefited for good? Does it have a longer term concept and effect on people? Have they been given skills or acquired skills that allow them to go off and do what they want to do themselves or couldn't do before? Are they empowered to go off and ask for support from healthcare providers or fill out a form or um, just be a little bit more confident to kind of get the best they can out of their life? So physical elements and abstract elements go together to allow a, an analysis of did that really go well and if it did go well or if it didn't go well, what are the differences it made? And those things loop. Now you can drop into this discussion at any point in time. So you might have been delivering for a while and actually you maybe need to start at outcomes and look at, you know, is it all working? Does it make sense? Or you might understand that you, what the inputs are, but need to spend a little bit more time on what some of the abstract outputs might be. Another way of looking at this is that it can absolutely work in a cycle and we have what's called the cycle of impact. There will be information about this in our resource section. But ultimately, the planning element of it, which is kind of starting to build the, the input, is decide ultimately what you want to do, what the point of your activity is. Are you trying to um, reduce anxiety, you're trying to build confidence, you're trying to reduce the stress of food poverty, are you trying to create more healthy lives for people, whatever your mission is. Think about what the ultimate end goal happens to be and think about it that it doesn't have to be huge, it doesn't have to be massively life-changing. Try and keep it as achievable as you possibly can. Once you've worked out what you ultimately want to do, you're going to think about how you're going to measure this. Because we deal in such abstract concepts as a sector, sometimes we might have to think about the benchmarking that we need to do in advance when we first meet people. Do we need to ask them about their confidence level or their skill level or how empowered they feel right now? Because we're then going to ask them to regrade themselves once they've come out the other end of your service. So part of that planning is what do I want to do and how am I going to make sure it's happened? How am I going to count it? We then get to the kind of the output input bit where we actually do the thing. So deliver the work, use all the physical stuff, use all the abstract stuff. And then as you're doing it, collect all the information you need. 
it's a total top tip to collect it as you go because the chances of anybody remembering what they were doing six weeks ago is slim to none so do it as you go and that's that's why everything fits under do it's about making everything happen in one go once that round has happened once that service has happened once the summer is over whatever it is that you've kind of finished this time with this group of people we're going to look at the assessment stage now the assessment stage is taking all the information you've got and trying to draw some sort of sense out of it trying to find a commonality trying to find the um, impact that was there so looking at the benchmark that you got before and after looking at the, the feedback that you got um, looking at your own kind of reflections and um, conversations that you've had amongst your team and then start to compare some of those findings with either previous work or if this is the first time you've did it this is a real benchmark that you've set which you are then going to review use these findings to inform your next planning use these findings to tell people about it that's that's the time when you shout about what you're doing or what you've done it's not necessarily at the start because actually at the start you might be recruiting which is fine you can absolutely promote that but a lot of groups forget to promote themselves at that review stage you're kind of as good as the impact that you're making so ultimately that's the time to start shouting saying all the good stuff that you do so it works in a cycle and we're ultimately doing plan do assess review it kind of rhymes it was my attempt that it would rhyme and it becomes a excellent repetitive chant so say it with me plan do assess review plan put everything in place make it happen then evaluate it and then look at the whole process and use those findings to influence the next time you plan remember what happened the last time we're going to change this or we're going to add that in or wouldn't it be great if because remember when we did it the last time etc etc so plan do assess review and it ultimately means your impact will be measured very timely it will be effective and honest and it will really heavily reflect exactly what it is that you you are doing and have done and it means that you can really demonstrate your success in a in a strong way one thing that thwarts um impact measurement and indeed organizations in general is this concept and it's called mission drift you might have heard of mission drift kind of from a business perspective and it's something that is uh, sometimes mentioned on the apprentice in terms of you went entirely off mission or you went entirely off brief mission drift is about staying on target and staying on the promise that you made to yourselves and the community so mission drift is it comes in a couple of different forms mission drift itself is about going away from your original object or your original promise so if your original promise was to um, support people through food poverty and you go down a whole route about um, hairdressing kind of irrelevant sort of connected because self-esteem and stuff and often you can see how organizations get to the drift you can absolutely see how the group of people that they originally support could kind of ask for that other thing so sometimes mission drift is logical but actual drift is about moving away from your original object mission creep is slightly different and it's about adding things in which are kind of not connected but again you could sort of make a connection so you might do food poverty and you might be a food bank but you decide to then launch into cookery classes or something which is kind of connected but it's not really because the food that you used to cook isn't stuff that the food bank might give or you might do um swimming lessons and 
I'm immediately regretting where I'm, what I'm talking about here because I don't know where I'm going with swimming lessons. So let's park that as an example. And I'm just going to ask you to trust me on what mission creep is. Because, yeah, I'm human. Mission cohesion is ultimately what we're heading towards, which is where I should have got to in the first place. That was a brilliant example of mission creep, but I just went off on a random tangent for no apparent reason. So mission cohesion is about keeping everything connected. It's about your mission statement, your objective, matching with your activities, matching with the promotion that you have and the, the, the branding, the ideology, the outward presentation of your organisation. It's about everything matching up and looking trustworthy and being trustworthy, looking professional and being professional. Now, professional doesn't have to mean paid. Professional doesn't have to mean stuffy and formal. It just means thought about, considered, did with care and consideration and heart. There's lots of different ways of being professional. Professional doesn't have to be a shirt and a tie and a lanyard. So it's thinking about, does all of it join up? Does it all make sense? Has it all been really thought about? And is it, can it be accused of being rogue as well? Because if you've started to go rogue, you've started to drift from your mission and that creates a lot of additional risk. And the risk around drift is that it creates damage to the, rep kind of the reputation of the organisation. Funders get a bit baffled, stakeholders get a bit baffled, the general public gets a bit baffled because we funded you to do this thing and here is the project, but as part of the project you're doing this completely different thing which has nothing to do with that that we've given you money for and the people that have turned up expecting service A are getting service J and they kind of sound a bit similar but they're actually quite different and now I don't know who you are and actually if I don't know what's going on and you don't seem to know what's going on I'm not going to come along and play anymore and I'm not going to access your service I'm going to go somewhere else what you could also do which is sometimes challenging especially in our sector is you jump on fashion or you jump on an immediate need as opposed to a long-term need. And it could be that you're trying to essentially, sort of to use a metaphorical sticking plaster, it's that thing of, oh, people need this right now, but actually does providing them this right now really give them what they need? Or are you setting up future challenges that you're potentially never going to be able to solve? It also means that you can go in lots of different directions and this is um, taken uh, from uh, a guidance website that we, that we have called NCVO which is the infrastructure governing body and it talks about often when organisations mission drift they get a bit too much like a business and they start to get a bit cutthroat like businesses or they think about profit they kind of move away from that kind of community spirited um, organisation full of heart. If we think back to the public benefit discussion and we think about the idea of doing more harm than good, sometimes it's possible that we can have too much heart, we can jump on a fashion, we can jump on an immediate challenge and not necessarily think about is this a long term solution, is it a sustainable solution? Or is it just a sticking plaster? And if we all provide sticking plasters, we just end up with some massive wounds that we can't ever heal because nobody's really got to the root of the problem. And that's a big part of Mission Drift. It's about having a strong mission, looking at the root of the challenge, because ultimately we're trying to keep things simple. We're trying to make it as simple as we possibly can because as I said in the intro, things are hard. It's a lot of work. And the more complicated and the more... Um, I don't want to say ambitious because there's nothing wrong with ambition, but the more, the more we start to diversify, 
beyond that capacity, the harder it gets. So, compiled some tips and tricks from many years of learning and many years of working with some groups around that element of keeping it simple. Did you know you can make electronic decisions? We talk about decision logs and action logs. They don't have to be paper. They could be on shared drives. And again, WV can support you in setting up those kind of systems. But the speed that you can work with an electronic decision um, and get your organization moving is, is vast. As long as you've got that recorded, you're absolutely valid to make electronic decisions. Just make sure it's in your governing document. If you can, keep a routine, keep a system. And if you can't, stop and ask yourself why you can't. Keep a fixed time for meetings, keep a fixed time for evaluating. Put in your diary the review of policies. Ideally, they should be annually, but you could probably get away with it every 18 months if nothing really changes. But make sure you do it. So many people that say, oh, I can't come to this because I don't have time, I can't have this. What is it that is taking up your time? Think about keeping that routine. Think about trying to simplify things. We meet a lot of people who are really on the edge of giving everything up because whatever cause that they're working for, whatever group that they're supporting, whatever group that they're running, is taking up all their life and they're struggling to have a social life or their families are getting more and more annoyed at them because they're always out with those people rather than spending time with them. And it's about having that group life balance. I said earlier, you can't change the world. And I, I, I mean, it, you, you can't. Um, think about whatever you're doing as being realistic and being achievable and don't set yourself mammoth tasks that you're never going to achieve because all you're going to do is beat yourself up so think about creating and maintaining a group life balance and that you need time to recharge and you need time to refresh and if you don't give yourself those times what use are you going to be and i I'm going to use RuPaul logic here of if you can't love yourself, how are you going to love anybody else? You need to be fit and well for everybody around you, but most importantly, yourself. And if you burn out trying to help, you're not going to help anyone. Keeping it real is a big part of that. And it's about being honest with you and everybody around you as to what, what we can achieve and what we can do and what we do well. Um, just because there's a need doesn't mean you have to try and fulfill it. Stick with the thing you're good at. Stick with the thing you know. And if you don't know, ask and try and learn. And if it doesn't make sense to you or you're not able to do it, don't pretend that you can because in the longer term, that's only going to create more problems for you to solve or more problems for somebody else to solve. And even though we are our own individual organisations, we are working towards one big collective cause. Asking for help is not in any way a shameful thing. It's much more a sign of strength than it is a sign of weakness. So find who you can drop an email to or pick up the phone to or have periodic catch ups with. Find your support network, find like minded people who understand the challenges that you might be having. If you're a chair or a secretary or a volunteer manager or a person running a service or whatever that might be, find those people that can help you out, seek that support and provide that support too as much as it's great to seek that support and get that support from other people it's also good to give it and hopefully in your group life balance you can find a way of helping other groups as well as other groups helping you use as much tech if you can it's 
a massive resource, especially around keeping your documents, updating your documents, your minutes, etc., your communication, um, even just new and diverse ways of keeping in touch with people. We could absolutely argue that beyond, well, the time of recording this is 2021, beyond the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, we never thought we would deliver groups by sitting at a screen. We've moved on so far, but also how we balance those things. Technology is great, but it's not the be all and end all. Use it if you can, use it if people that you're working with can do, but also remember how you juggle those two things together and create that blended approach. Be open and honest, transparent with your decisions, with your documentation, where your money's come from, where your money's going, what you intend to do in the future, um, what didn't work. Again, no shame in something not working, but it's the learning and the development that is the mark of the good organisation. It's not a mark against you that something didn't work because things don't work all the time. And often in this sector we're doing things that have never been carried out before or never been delivered before and so much of it is an experiment so much funding acknowledges that we're piloting this idea because people have kind of, people have asked for it but we don't know whether it's going to work so we're giving it a go be open and honest when things work be open and honest when things don't work and you know if somebody gets in touch with you and you says how did you do that it's not a massive secret so it would be nice if people could share and interact and kind of partner rather than trying to monopolize and hold on. My own addition to this, speaking as me, not WVA, there's 200 and odd thousand people in the town. There's enough people to go around. So you know, we're, we're all trying to protect something, but actually a bit of sharing wouldn't work. And I'm going to bring this point back because it's so important that you literally, you can't save the world. You can, you can make a darn good go at it. You can save a little part of it, or you could relieve some stress and tension and anxiety and maybe solve some problems for local people. And you know what? That is a huge, huge thing. And everything that you do is pretty darn magic. So don't underestimate the little things. Other elements to simplicity on probably a more practical level. Keep to your mission, which means first of all, periodically revisit your mission. Does it still make sense? Does it still use words that are relevant today? Does it still use sentiments that are relevant today? Is what you're doing still logical? And part of it or do you need to tweak your mission in order to fit your activity because sometimes that happens sometimes your activities grow and develop and react to the community and are absolutely what is needed but our mission hasn't been looked at and the two things don't align that becomes a challenge when you start asking for funding or asking people to partner with you because there is no kind of logical alignment through all your um, ideology Keep measuring, keep knowing that what you're doing is working. And if it isn't working, how do you tweak it? So continually impact measurement, continue to gather the voices of the people that you support, the voices of the people around you. Make sure that everything you're doing is relevant. And that involves recording. Protect your liability by recording all your decisions and actions. Keep accurate minutes. So your action logs and decision logs complement your minutes. Um, they, they don't kind of replace or fight against them. Equally record your successes and record things publicly and openly. Share things on social media. That's all part of recording too. Funders will report back that they really like to watch projects grow and develop and evolve by looking at the social media posts and looking at the images and things that they share. So recording can be formal, but it can also be informal. And sometimes that informal has much, much bigger impact. Keep your roles defined. Sometimes, yes, it's impossible to just be one role. And increasingly today, nobody is ever just one job. 
but try and maintain at least some sort of consistency keep each role defined because that's about liability it's about accuracy it's about accountability so set descriptions and it could well be that somebody is part treasurer part secretary part f fundraiser and actually this kind of blended role is one person the other part of secretary is part of somebody else's role who are also the health and safety person we don't have to have fixed humans doing all one role as long as the tasks are covered it doesn't matter who does them but ultimately think about the tasks you need done and then work out who's going to do that All it remains for me to do is thank you for making it through this hour and 10 minutes and all the information is provided either in the description box below which will take you to our resource section or um, some other links that I've provided. By all means ask us anything about this, we can make this bespoke to your organisation, we can help you through any part of your journey and thank you for your time, I will see you in the next one.